So Amanda and Jameson, it is, it is fantastic to finally get to meet you in person. <laughs> Great to meet you. Uh, pleasure. So uh, share with me, since, uh, since we've never really talked uh, before, other than you know, sharing emails back and forth and, uh, and chapter edits, um, give me and those that are watching a little bit of background as to uh, what each of you, what your area of expertise is uh, in your research. Uh, go ahead, Amanda. Okay. Um, so my name is Amanda Potterton, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky in um, the Department of Educational Leadership Studies. Um, the work that I do is related to education policy and equity issues, specifically around choice, school choice, um, more broadly than charter schools, but the consideration of um, what happens as choice options expand um, in neighborhoods and areas and how that affects communities. So um, I'm also interested in privatization and the way privatization and markets and education um, affect students who are living in poverty, um, students who are English language learners, students who receive special education services. Um, and so recently got to write this chapter with Jameson, we're really glad to be here. Uh, Jameson Brewer, I'm an assistant professor of social foundations of education in the, uh, formerly the teacher education department, now the uh, specifically the culture, language and leadership uh, department within the College of Education at the University of North Georgia. So that's a big mouthful, but um, uh, I am a former K-12 teacher. Uh, I taught middle school and high school uh, social studies and history uh, and uh, current, currently teach a uh, uh, primarily undergraduate teachers uh, who are training to become teachers. And uh, my uh, specific research in the area of education policy looks uh, similarly to Amanda's uh, broadly at the, at the impact of, broadly the uh, impact of- Sorry. No, it's fine. It's, it's the world we live in, right? Uh, but uh, <laughs> looking at the impact of privatization um, in all things K-12 education, of course, that manifests in a lot of different ways. It can be uh, charter schools, uh, school vouchers, and of course, those are becoming more popular even among the pandemic um, homeschooling, alternative teacher certification, and how uh, those things operate um, uh, individually and separately, but also as a, a part and connected to a broader uh, venture philanthropic uh, effort to fund uh, the privatization of education, which is what our chapter is about. Yeah, so uh, I, I definitely want to make sure that we dive into um, some of the changes that we've seen because of the pandemic. Uh, because, of course, when your chapter was written um, and when the book was put together, uh, it wasn't done with the pandemic in mind because none of us knew that it was going to happen. Um, and, and it's um, uh, in some ways your, your chapter was prescient uh, as to uh, some of the things that have happened so far. Um, but you know, I, I want to say to both of you, and I don't know if I expressed this because uh, we only went back and forth on email, but, but your chapter is one that um, from the first iterations of, of this book and the outlines that I was putting together, I knew that this, this chapter was going to be foundational. And I knew that it had to be in the book. I mean, you, you know, when you edit a book, certain things come in and out and you switch. But this is one that I knew have, uh, had to be in there because it was so important. Um, and the way that the two of you pulled it off was just brilliant. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into this discussion. Um, but let's start we with- appreciate, We appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, but let's dive into a little bit the, the idea of a public good and what that is, because I think um, in some circles that might be a term that's not necessarily used very often. So when we talk about uh, the importance of education as a public good, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, for me, I, I think that, you know, the sort of the, the binary and uh, in some ways it's a dichotomy and, and I, I don't want to give the impression that all things fit perfectly into what is public and ver what is individualistic or private, um, but, but we can talk about it in, in those terms. I think that all of us, uh, I think that most, at least in the American context, if you ask anybody, you know, what are, what are some of the things that they cherish the most about our, our nation and our country and society, uh, at least in my experience, the things that those people mention are almost entirely things that we would consider to be a public good, right? And so uh, in no particular order, you know, by, might be the military, it might be roads, it could be schools and libraries and, and all of these things that, that provide services to the collective for the benefit of the individual, right, obviously, but through the, the commitment and full understanding that, that by benefiting the individual at the, 
the, the expense, and, and I mean that specifically in terms of, of tax funding, uh, is not just a benefit to that individual that by uh, building up and uh, investing in individuals and communities in, in the, the process, the entire society receives a, a, a return on that. And, and I, I generally don't like to use business language, but to use the business language, because that's sort of where the, the privatization comes in. It, it's one of the best return on investments that, that we have are, are publicly funded services uh, for myriad reasons, just simply the, the fact that it, uh, things become easier to accomplish and afford when, when it's, you know, collective, uh, that's how insurance works, right? I mean, it's uh, you know, thinking about what is beneficial to every person and simultaneously beneficial uh, to the collective. Yeah. Amanda, anything you want to add there? No, I think Jameson did a great job. Um, I think that something that stands aside, and I was just pulling up our chapter here because we were talking about it and thinking about it earlier, something that um, where we start to blur those lines between what is a public good and what is a private good, um, what happens with policy is that um, depending on what policies are in place, um, that line can become blurrier and blurrier. And so um, when we talk about public schools, we're talking about like the the locus, like that focus of um, uh, accountability, that there is an expectation that um, for transparency um, to support the collective community. Um, and so that is a commitment. And Jameson and I spoke at the beginning of our chapter, he included an example about a fire, about firefighting. And I thought that was really good about, you know, the services the firefighters that our police provide. Um, and then the, our public schools, our public institutions. So. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, and you make this point in the chapter that nobody is calling for there to be competing private, uh, you know, police forces out there to serve the public, right? You know that that's that that the competition would make police forces better, um, or firefighters, or libraries, or the military. Uh, and I think hey. that's a really important point to make. And and you know, as we we say in the chapter, there was a time in history where firefighting was not conceived of as a public or or a collective good, right? And it was very individualistic. It was a commodity to be bought and sold, just in the way that um, you know, car insurance is, fire insurance. Until people realize that if my neighbor's house is on fire and burning whether or not that person had fire insurance or whether their company was good or not the very threat to their home was not only an immediate threat to would spread but also the suffering that would be had by that family the collective society would would step in to have to take care of the family as societies do but in understanding that if we all take care of that on the front end by having a publicly funded and operated firefighting department in this case that it prevents the necessity for that. And the same thing works in education. We know that early investment in education pays off dramatically in terms of the lived experience of individuals as adults, but also in terms of what it costs society in the long run. We know how much more beneficial it is to do that. And again, it, it's with, with everything that, that has at its core that commitment to uh, you know, what is beneficial to the, pub, to the public and to the collective good. Yeah, I want to go back to something that Amanda said um, a minute ago, and you mentioned accountability. And there's this amazing line uh, at the end of your chapter that you put in, um, where you mentioned that uh, reimagining education as an individual good rather than a public good uh, releases society and communities of their shared obligation to our children. And and I really, as I reread your chapter, as I got ready for this interview, I really pondered over this this one line for a while, because I think. You know, when, when you look at the conversations around public education and democracy in general, um, everybody is looking for someone else to solve it. And everyone wants, you know, like, give me mine out of the system, right? But, but the problems are someone else's. And I think this one sentence speaks to that so well in public education. So I wonder if both of you want to comment on that. Jameson, if you want to start. Go ahead, Amanda, no, go ahead. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, thank you for thinking about that. And I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, another part, just as we're talking, it's great that we didn't really talk right before we started, you jumped right in. So <laughs> we, this is the time that we all get to talk about it face to face is that, um, you know, when we think about education as this commodity, right, this thing that's bought and traded in, in a marketplace, um, 
which happens. And um, we spoke um, a bit earlier, Jameson and I, about these learning pods that are um, popping up um, due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that we can do to exacerbate um, inequalities and things that we can do to bridge that gap. Um, and things like tax credit programs, things like um, sp specifically, not all like charter school programs that do not serve the full population of students like in a community um, are all things that can exacerbate inequalities. And, and if I can, I wanna, I wanna be clear, and, and we went at length in the chapter to be clear about this as well. It, it's important for us to point out that uh, public schools as a public good uh, haven't actually always lived up to that uh, expectation that we have, right? And, and in particular for students of color and, and students living in poverty, right? So, so this should never be misunderstood as, you know, uh, a critique of privatization is a full endorsement of how the status quo has always operated, right? That, that shouldn't be understood that way. But to that point, if, if we shift the, into, uh, Michael, you're pulling out that, that specific sentence, if we shift the accountability to the individual, if we say, listen, uh, rather than us conceive of this effort as a collective society, that we have this obligation that I, as a, a citizen, as a, a father myself, as an educator, et cetera, if I uh, cease to understand that I have an obligation uh, to my neighbor's children and then, you know, the, the children down the road um, and, and switch it to the sort of com private commodity where it's individualistic. Hey, here's a voucher. Uh, here's full choice. Everyone go uh, take care of it by yourself. Go get your own. That will only exacerbate the very racial and economic inequalities that, that are currently existing which need to be addressed. And there, there have been a lot of efforts, uh, good ones to address those things, but uh, a doubling down on thinking about it in terms of, uh, hey, every, every man, every woman, every person for themselves, you know, to heck with uh, everyone else, that's in the exact opposite direction of where we, we likely need to go. Yeah, and, and I'm, I want to dive into that equity issue in a second. And Amanda, I'm going to throw that to you because I know that's really your area of expertise and, um, and you know, you've done a ton of research in this area. Um, but, but to your point, Jameson, when we think about framing things in that individualistic manner where everyone's out for themselves and it's the, it's the responsibility of parents to choose good education for their kids and everyone else is kind of absolved of their responsibility. I think of a conversation I had, I was, uh, I was getting ready to vote in a school board election probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, and there, I was wearing a shirt that indicated I was a teacher. It must've been a teacher's union shirt or whatever I was wearing. Uh, and an elderly woman in her, probably in her eighties was next to me. And she said, yeah, um, you know, like, I don't understand why I still have to pay school taxes. Like my kids have been out, you know, like I don't have any grandkids. My kids have been out of the system for, you know, for decades. And my response to her was, don't you want to live in an educated society? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, like it's not, education is not just for parents or not just for students. Uh, all of us benefit from a, a thriving, healthy public education system. And, and I think that's really the point that all of us are trying to make all of these chapters in the book, that without a healthy uh, flipped, democratized public education system, we can't get our larger democracy, uh, you know, to be healthy. Which, you know, that 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 sort of line, I, I've heard that countless times, right, <laughs> in, in my career, um, even from family and friends, whether it is, you know, I, I no longer have kids in the system, or even some people have said, I've, I've never had kids, you know, all this other stuff. Right. It, it, it strikes me uh, certainly as coming from a, a disposition of, of selfishness, uh, and you know maybe that's a separate conversation we can have. But my my question to the, those people are always: I, I hear what you're saying. Tell me who paid for your education, mm -hmm. because somebody in that process, in that formula, who paid for yours also didn't have kids, or their kids were no longer in the system, right? And so. It, it's it's difficult to sort of cash in your chips uh, that were funded by somebody else gave you the chips and you're you're playing you know I'll use a, a poker metaphor you, you're putting in the chips and playing your hand uh, and then wanting to take all your chips and run home right and so it's like you know the the, the kid who gets mad and, and takes and says I'm going to take the ball away and go home and no one can play anymore right so uh, it's it's very problematic but it's the same thing and again uh, I think it's important often in these conversations to take it beyond education because everyone fancies themselves as an expert in education policy 
think about it again to the firefighting thing. I myself have, have thankfully never had to call the, the fire department for anything in my home. But it would be ludicrous for me, and I think everyone would agree, to suggest that I should no longer have to pay, you know, my portion of taxes that that fund the local fire department. That's just we wouldn't have that. Or, you know, I pay my portion that goes to the military industrial complex, and, you know, or any of these things, right? I mean, it's it's so interesting and fascinating that when we when we when it comes to education, so many of our fellow uh, citizens are so willing to think about it in different terms and you know some of the work that I do on Teach for America it, you know and thinking about these alternative certification programs it's you know let's move it to something else you know would anybody be okay with police for America or doctors for America or pilots for America the answer is immediately no but I, I for the life of me I can't understand why we're so readily um, uh, quick to suggest that we cease this this broad public uh, investment in education, even after you know uh, ourselves or our children are out of it. Because to your point, society continues to benefit and always will, just in the way that it always has. So Amanda, let me let me go back to what we were talking about before and what um, both of you started to frame a little bit as we were talking um, about how. Uh, and, and I think Jameson put this so well that um, by saying that privatization causes issues of equity uh, does not necessarily absolve us of the recognition that our public education system has also <laughs> caused issues of, of inequity um, in its history and still does. Um, but, but talk a little bit about why privatization, um, school vouchers, the charter system, you know, all, all of those things in general. Um, yeah, because, because let's face it, the, the argument from... Um, from certain families would be if you take away this option for my student, whether it's the voucher, the charter school, if, if you take away this choice from my child, there's no viable alternative. You're taking away their chance for a decent education, right? You know, so, so how can this, how can taking away that be a positive for solving some of our inequities? That's, those are great questions. And I'm thinking here and making some notes. One of the things um, when I started doing research in school choice um, that you quickly find out is it is like a boxing arena. So the, the discussions around choice are you are either <laughs> often and, and debated as and you are for charters, you're against them. Um, you are for public education, you are not, you know, and um, when I started researching in communities and getting to know parents and teachers and school leaders. Um, they were having very, very um, emotional, honest conversations about the struggles that they faced in making decisions for their children. So it wasn't a black or white issue in terms of this is a, it was a whole lot of in between. Um, it was parents who, um, in an area where there was a lot of school choice, um, a lot of charter schools, um, they supported their public school. But so I guess when I talk about market-based charter school systems or market-based systems and ways of looking at education or vouchers that can, you can take taxes and you can put them into, um, put them in your pocket and then, you know, you spend them how you want at, at your child's school. Those are the things, the broader issues that are kind of like the macro um, equity issues that uh, I think um, we can deal with and talk about at a policy level or at a, you know, and think about changes and because they haven't, they haven't always been here. I mean, I, I came from Arizona where we had so many charters to Kentucky who, although we passed a charter school bill, we don't have any charter schools. Now people have been choosing schools all along by um, the houses they buy or the zoned neighborhoods that they buy into. And um, that, and, and like Jameson said, we can't like, there's this romantic, we say in the chapter, this romantic like imaginary picture of when things were rosy and perfect um, back in the day when there was um, a public school system and no, no market-based charter schools, no, none of this. But I think that um, the dangers are how we, um, <clears throat> how money is directed, right? Um, how how policies are made and what they include and do not include. So, for example, if they if they don't include um, um, requirements for schools to show how they're going to meet um, match the demographic of the students 
it, who live in the area, um, you know, that could be problematic because state to state school choice rules are different. Mm. There's inter and intra district district school choice, but there's also these tax programs, right? And so if you can take money and put it into um, a school of your choice and, or if the money follows a student, um, if it follows a student to a charter school, that's less money that is in that public school, you know, and, and you can see the videos on your website and chapters of so many amazing, amazing public school teachers who are working so hard and doing so many amazing and creative things. And there's been this um, discourse, this dialogue for a while, for a long time, you know, about that there's something wrong with our charter schools. And David Berliner and Biddle wrote about this saying, you know, like the, the um, manufactured crisis of schools. When we really look at and disaggregate based on um, issues related to socioeconomic status and poverty, right? We don't have, or, or you know, and students who are receiving different kinds of services. You know, we're, our schools provide a lot. And Jameson and I also talked earlier and said, like, if anything, during this pandemic, something we've seen and with our families is how much more our public schools provide for our children than just um, the academics, right? Um, be able to see their friends, to be able to negotiate um, life together without their parents around. Um, you know, it's been phenomenal to see. Now that can happen in public and private schools, but I think it's how it's how we're um, how we're honoring and talking about our public schools, um, and how we're supporting our teachers, um, and um, understanding that as, as a public education system, the idea is is around that is around being a public collective good. Um, is, you know, people send their children to private schools. It's when it's when, and that's okay. And for in my, in my opinion and the research that I've done, you know, my thoughts are more about like when we start taking for ourselves and not being able to see past here and how it affects others. Um, so these parents I spoke with, you know, would be tearful. Um, you know, they did support their public schools, um, but because of the finances, their children had so many ch um, other children in class that they were really struggling in a math class, for example. And so, so what do I do tomorrow, you know? Or what about parents right now with the learning pods who are like, what do I do? My partner and I both work. How, how do I manage this, right? Um, do I get a tutor, a babysitter or someone who can come in or should we create this pod? These are sympathetic conversations. I mean, they're hard conversations because it's what we're faced with, but the system, the the policy system around us um, can do better with how we talk about our public schools and how we honor them through taxes and public money. Yeah, I, I love, there's so, so many things, I was jotting down notes as you were speaking because there's so many things I love about that answer. Uh, but I'll just start with, you got a smile out of me because my first teaching job uh, 23, 24 years ago um, was uh, in Arizona, I taught in Mesa, Arizona, uh, in a charter school right when the charter movement was uh, was oh. just launching. I actually graduated from the University of Scranton here in Northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, found my first teaching job, moved cross country for a year, uh, and then wow. came back to teach here. Um, so when you mentioned <laughs> the mm -hmm. charter movement in Arizona, you got a smile out of me there because I, I know that that well. Um, but, but what I really loved about that answer is the systems thinking that you mentioned. Because I think so many times, even, even if it's not that uh, talking about individual parents, when we tend to compare public schools and charter and charter schools, we often compare like this one school that's doing great work, right, whether it's public or private, and we compare it to this other school. And we never really look at what are the outcomes of the system. Um, what are the resources that we're putting in? What are the resources that we're getting out? And and what are the the what's the movement of the resources within that system? Uh, mm -hmm. And and you're talking at it at a much more uh, uh, much broader level, which I think allows us to have conversations that uh, where where we can be a little less emotional about it and get to the root causes of some of the problems that we're seeing. Yeah, and and I would just say there to that as well as it's right that macro the micro on the ground experiences of families we're we're you know families do the best they can who's not going to do the best for their child and there are fair um, honest arguments from people who will say well should I not be able to um, send my child to a school. Um, can they only go to this school because this is where we live and we can't afford to live in that neighborhood? I mean, is, is that fair? 
you know, in a, in a public system. And so there are lots of things like this, but it's what we do at the um, macro level. What are we supporting? What, what bills are we pushing? At the local, state, federal level, um, what are our secretaries of education saying in supporting our public schools or supporting um, parents going off and do this themselves when, you know, we are in a, in a crisis mode and it's, you know, people are trying to figure this out. So it's kind of interesting because it's new and nobody knows what that looks like um, and what it will look like in a year from now. Yeah. Janice, I want, I want to come back to you for a second because um, I'm, I'm guessing that this falls more in um, part of what you wrote in the chapter, but feel free to throw it to Amanda if I've got that wrong. Um, but in the chapter, you really talk about the metrics that are being used to drive some decision making um, in our education system that, that are leading us down this path of, uh, of a more individualistic view of public education. Um, and uh, whether it's test scores or other metrics that we're using uh, and the validity or invalidity um, of those metrics and some of the, um, I, I think nefarious is probably too too strong of a word or maybe it's not, but but you don't use that word in the no, chapter. I, so I, will, no, I won't put that word in your mouth. <laughs> no, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable word to use. <laughs> but, but talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I think that you just sort of mentioned the uh, the practice of comparing, you know, singular, you know, charter school A to public school A, and and that that is, it becomes problematic both in the charter school as well as you know private schools through vouchers. It it really is not an apples to apples comparison, right? You you have people who are selecting into the treatment. There's selection bias. There's you know we. We often see from a lot of these, you know, think tanks and intermediary organizations, you know, they, they like to uh, put forward gold standard randomized controlled trials. And that's that works for um, for things like COVID vaccines, right, where you have a placebo and you're you're testing the difference in the outcomes between the placebo and the treatment. Uh, the problem is, is that if uh, just for I'm not going to name any of their names, but let's say a uh, company A who's trying a COVID vaccine now. Uh, informs every single person who is actually receiving the treatment, hey, you are receiving the treatment, and every person who's received the placebo shot, hey, you're receiving the placebo, it would completely nullify the results, and you could not make any comparative conclusions about differences between the groups. From the outset, that's the problem with, with these comparisons between these schools, but broadly, let, let's, say, let's say, for example, that, that test scores matter, which it's important for me to point out that I don't really think that they matter uh, as certainly not as much as they have become, you know, since, uh, you know, Not Child Left Behind and Race at the Top and all these sort of, you know, fanciful repackaging of the exact same thing. But, and, and here's the thing, it, to the extent that um, a, a school or, or even a teacher, in my view, to the extent that uh, somebody can report this massive increase in test scores, for example, it, it, if it is true and if it is the, the, the case that those scores are not illusory and temporary and, and you know, somehow gained in some way, uh, and, you know, it wasn't a result of just teaching to the test or backwards teaching, you know, all these other things, it, it, all of those caveats aside, if the singular thing that we're using uh, to compare students or compare schools, and I think this is even within public education, we have a hard time getting beyond this because of a lot of our policies. Um, for a school to say that they are the best at raising test scores, for me, that means that, that they may, they're likely the very best at what is the very worst in education these days, right? And it's, it's, it's fine for the metric that it is. I, I like to do a lot of barbecue and, and cooking and, you know, it makes sense to have a, a, a thermometer probe, you know, you have to understand what's going on, you know, but I, I don't put 20 of them inside of something I'm, I'm trying to determine whether it's ready to take off of the smoker. So this, this mass hysteria over let's, let's have, you know, 20 tests so that we can see if there's changes so that we can determine the value of the student, you know, so that the student themselves can then determine and somehow, um, you know, convert that to some college entry or we can uh, uh, tie your pay as a teacher directly to these things. It's a mess and it's, it's not a good mess and it doesn't tell us much. And it seems to me that, that the charters, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm talking about globally, I'm not talking about singular ones, uh, they do um, 
tend to focus, you know, especially some of the bigger chains like KIPP, you know, tend to focus almost exclusively on teaching to the test and increasing test scores. Uh, and so when, when your thumb is on the scale uh, for a scale that I don't think is worth really measuring that much, I, for me, the, the claims of, of comparisons between the two are, are lost uh, on the face of it. If I may. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, what I thought about while we're talking about this, to me, the, you know, the word competition is in my head, right? And so it's when, you know, we all want our children to learn. And, and sometimes we have, you know, diagnostic tools to help us know what they've mastered and what they need to do next. And that's, I, you know, I think that, you know, these can be really good things and, and, and supporting us as we move along, right? But, you know, what Jameson said about when we start putting competitive pressure with really poorly, um, po like with a lot of error in some of these models, because we're doing, you know, we're in social science, right? Our classrooms are not all the same. Our students are not all the same. Our teachers are not all the same. You know, what's going on in the children's home is not the same everywhere. And so when we start like pitting people or groups or schools against others, then we're creating a competitive environment which when Jameson and I talk about markets versus kind of the notion of the collective and the public, uh, it's sort of that like rich get richer argument, right? Um, when you're competing, somebody will win, somebody will lose. Is that really what we want, you know, for our schools and for our children and for our teachers? Is that, you know, how we envision public schools? So I just think that's the, that competition in there and how we use these tools and numbers. Yeah, so before I ask you, we're almost out of time. I'm gonna ask you one more question. I really wanna dive into the pandemic and how that is, uh, and, and how that intersects with what you wrote. Uh, but Jameson, I wanna point out uh, to you that um, we, we've become Facebook friends and I follow you on social media now for the past couple of years. And uh, I'm very aware of your smoking, uh, you know, the, the smoked meats. Uh, and I went vegetarian two years ago and um, your Facebook oh. posts are one, of the, one of the few things that make me crave bacon again. So. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so so uh, so many different topics in the book, whether it's um, some of the uh, rural equity issues, whether it's some of the uh, racial issues that we see in our school system, uh, whether it's the need for social emotional learning, so many of the chapters in the book um, have become more important uh, through COVID. You know, uh, they've really uh, COVID has really exacerbated and and exposed some of those. Uh, problems in our education system. And I think the same is true for your chapter. Uh, and you mentioned some of the learning pods that we're seeing because, uh, you know, kids are having to learn at home. Um, but I think there's also a, a more macro view of how um, some of the, um, you know, every, I don't know who it was that said it, but like never waste a good crisis. <laughs> and we definitely see that with people who are trying to push for more privatization. Uh, so uh, if you want to touch on either the micro or the macro, um, but I'd love for both of you to just kind of chime in and share where you see this going because of uh, the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, if it's okay to say, I, I think that the one benefit that has been COVID uh, has been a reminder, or or at least it, it should have been, or and perhaps it was in the beginning and we've lost sight of it, of how connected and reliant we are on a cohesive society and and my ability to to look out for you, right? And 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 that's that's the entire uh, you know epicenter of this mask debate, which I don't understand why masks are a debatable thing, but you know, I wear a mask in public, not because it protects me, but because it protects you, right? And so I, I think the, the silver lining of the pandemic is that it, it provided us an opportunity, a, a time, a, a space in time to uh, recommit to each other, to recommit to thinking about how my actions might impact you, right? And, and how we can work together to benefit each other as individuals, but also as collectives. I think that it, it's disheartening to see uh, some of the broad policy pushes, uh, you know, some at the state level and, and certainly at the, the federal level with Secretary DeVos, you know, who, uh, yeah, as you said, never never wastes a crisis, uh, whether it's a real one or a manufactured one uh, to push, you know, privatization, you know, so even when schools were uh, rightfully debating on whether or not to open back up in person or remain digital, you know, this sort of push that and we even heard it from, you know, President Trump himself that 
you know, the, the federal government will just, you know, allow parents to shift the money that goes to the schools to a, a you know, school of their choice. And, you know, that, that's coded language for, for private schools. The, the problem is, again, is not only, you know, I pay my, my property taxes, um, but the, the portion that I pay, that alone is not enough to cover what it costs to educate my daughter in the first grade, right? So you know, it, I hear, I see a lot of people beating their chest. It's my kid. It's my tax money. It's your kid. That's fine. But it's not all of your tax money. It's at least here in the, the county that I live in, it requires seven other families who are paying their property taxes to, to send my daughter to school. And so the, the suggestion that there would be some way because of this pandemic and taking advantage of this crisis and people's uh, uh, both real and perhaps some unfounded fears about it to suggest that I can then say, you know what, I, let me remove my daughter from this public school and take seven other families money with them that is removing that money from that local public school that may be serving their kid too and i get to go sit in my little corner with this with this pile of money and just take care of my own that that is exacerbating not just the the theoretical problem with what it means to be an individual versus the collective but also in terms of policy and financing, that public school is going to suffer as a result of that. And it could be that they can no longer provide meals and internet and all the other things that, and to Amanda's point, that have sort of come out uh, in, in public view of all of the things that schools provide to students and communities. It, it, th there is a direct one-to-one -one correlation threat uh, to that by shifting that money away. And it's, it's disheartening to see that you know, at this time when we, many of us have, and, and I hope that we will still continue to come together, that people are using it to to sort of push the exact opposite narrative that what we should be thinking about is not each other, uh, but what's good for ourselves. Amanda, did you want to jump in on that question? Um, I can do. Um... I don't think that any of this can be separated from power and politics. Um, and so that matters, you know? And then the words that people use, that individuals use, that we use, it matters. And we're seeing that across the board in terms of racism right now, in terms of, like you said, the pandemic, how that is becoming something that is, um, masks are politicized. Um, so what happens um, in November, I think, you know, will um, matter tremendously. And, and I, you know, I can't read into that except to know that, you know, right now, like there's been this something that I've seen and have, have felt is this, you know, moment of like really um, grounding ourselves in some humanity, like slowing down and some grace you know, even this, like here we are in an interview in our homes, like there's a, set, there's a bit of vulnerability, um, Skype calls coming in, <laughs> of who we are as parents, as who we are as mothers, as fathers, as scholars, as practitioners, um, to, for teachers who are managing all of those roles with their children, their own children at their side. These are not easy questions. And so I think there's, there's, there's always going to be tension between that competition, the, the public and what's good for the individual. I mean, that philosophically or theoretically, we can talk and talk about it, which we do for a bit and we have done tonight some. Um, and yet on the ground, we're all doing the best we can as parents and as scholars and as teachers um, to, you know, I think show kindness and grace in all of this and to, to help figure it out. So that, I don't know, I think the words we use matter. And um, I'm just, you know, so proud when I see how adaptable everyone is um, becoming during all of this and how hard everyone's working and how hard, you know, um, there's a podcast from NEPC, the National Education Policy Center out of Boulder that Janelle Scott, Dr. Janelle Scott out of Berkeley just, um, did it's a pretty short one but it's worth checking out where she talks they um christopher saldana asks her some questions about what do you think will happen with these learning pods and she talks about sort of well she talks about the macro and the micro and sort of venture philanthropy and like grants what are we going to do in response to this are we going to be you know how how what choices are we going to make um for our communities 
and for our neighborhoods um, and for, you know, for the public. Well, that is, I think that's a brilliant way to, to wrap up this conversation, bringing it back to uh, humanism and humanity and empathy um, and, and the practical implications of all of these things we're talking about on individual families, individual kids, individual communities. Uh, I think you did that so beautifully. Um, but thank you both for a brilliant conversation, for a brilliant chapter, for your contribution. Uh, and it's uh, one of the joys for me throughout this whole process has been getting to know uh, others who are doing similar work in similar spaces uh, that I didn't know before. So I am, I'm just honored and thrilled to be connected to both of you going forward. Likewise. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having us.